I'd like to begin a series of presentations on the history of philosophy. Philosophy is uh, literally the love of wisdom, and wisdom has to do with uh, the search for ultimate explanations or causes. There are different senses of the word wisdom as has been used down through the centuries. Uh, among the ancient Hebrews, as ex expressed in scripture, wisdom has more to do with the practical uh, insights that come from living. Uh, so presumably people who have lived a long time have seen certain patterns. They've seen things recur over and again. And the accumulation of that experience uh, among those who are wise leads them to be able to uh, perhaps predict uh, the kinds of behaviors that will lead to genuine happiness and, uh, and peacefulness versus those kinds of decisions that might lead one to ruin or might lead a person to a sad life or, uh, or something negative. On the other hand, you have the ancient Greeks who think about wisdom not so much in terms of practical insight, although that's included in it, but also wisdom is understood as uh, the search for understanding the more remote causes of things. Uh, we all search for understanding uh, the causes or explanations of things that happen on a, on a, a near level. Uh, for instance, if we, if we walk in our house and the door is unlocked and it's open and a window is broken or something like that, uh, we might draw the conclusion that someone is broken in the house. Uh, we make those kinds of inferences all the time. We see things that happen and then we make a judgment about what the cause of that might be. Uh, the, when the Greeks speak about looking for the causes of things, they're thinking about ultimate causes, not just the proximate causes, not things that happened uh, soon or, or recently or right at hand, but instead what are the, the basic structures of reality that cause it to function the way that it does. What are the ultimate causes of things uh, that explain why the world is as it is? Uh, so the, this understanding of causes or explanations is what will motivate us. There are different areas of philosophy, and certainly we don't have time to talk about all of them, and I'm just going to be making a rapid movement through the history of philosophy. Uh, as a Christian, there are lots of different reasons why I would study the history of philosophy. One of them is to, to see what the human intellect can discover and what can it know. On the one hand, you see that the history of philosophy yields a lot of confusion. And we might be tempted to draw the conclusion from that that we really can't know much as human beings, at least not know much for sure. And that would lead to a philosophical position called skepticism, that ultimately all positions cancel each other out and we can't be sure of anything. On the other hand, you have those who argue, no, we can know things for sure. Uh, we can have great confidence in the conclusions of the human intellect. There are some things, for example, that we do have a great deal of, of, uh, of certainty about or a great deal of common uh, consensus about. Uh, for instance, in the area of mathematics, uh, there are conclusions that people draw that there's not a whole lot of debate about the validity of those conclusions. Very simple conclusions of arithmetic or, or geometry or whatever uh, yield a great deal of consensus among those who take the time to think about those kinds of things. That suggests that there are some structures of logic or reason in the human mind that we can use to shine upon the experiences that we have and the things that we think about and that logic can yield certain conclusions that we that we are satisfied with as human beings. Certainly we should not begin the philosophical quest with the assumption that we are gods and that we can stand back from the whole universe or from everything and verify all of our conclusions from some transcendent standpoint that allows us to become superhuman. We are humans and therefore our conclusions participate in all of the weaknesses of being human. However, uh, even though our conclusions might, uh, you know, relate us to these, uh, uh, these human frailties, uh, at the same time, the human person uh, transcends or rises above the rest of the animal world in many remarkable ways uh, and allows us to think about things that are not directly related to our immediate survival. It seems as if the rest of the animal world focuses on uh, uh, concerns that have to do with their survival or their immediate sensory gratification, whereas human beings are able to reflect on things that don't have much of anything to do with our long-term survival. We just want to know. We want to understand. So human beings have the desire, for example, or have the ability to think about uh, complex mathematical problems or perhaps ultimate questions of causality for the universe that really don't have anything to do with our immediate sensory survival, but they simply satisfy a deep curiosity that characterizes human beings. 
we are curious beings. We want to know the answers to things. As Aristotle says at the beginning of one of his great works, he says, all men by nature desire to know. We want to understand reality. And it's that desire to understand the world, that basic curiosity that characterizes human beings, uh, that begins the motivation for the philosophical quest. Certainly, as a, again, as a Christian, and I'm presenting my uh, perspective of the history of philosophy and all the specific things that we speak about, I'm presenting it from a Christian standpoint because the ultimate goal that I have in presenting these things is to show how the insights of the great philosophers of history have been synthesized or have been developed or have been received within the Christian tradition and how the worldview of Christianity, the perspective of Christianity, uh, takes the insights of human reason and is able to assimilate them into itself and I think uh, bring it to a, a greater fullness or a greater perfection. And hopefully that will make some sense as we uh, continue our journey and as we walk through some of these great uh, philosophers of history. This is obviously an enormous task, and so it'll never be finished in the sense of we'll never be able to talk about every philosopher. There are a lot of great thinkers. Uh, there are some uh, very fine thinkers living today. There are some very fine thinkers that have lived in our own century. But there are countless thinkers down through the centuries uh, that, that I don't know about or I don't know a great deal about their thought. Uh, but uh, but there are many that I do and that I would like to share their insights. Uh, but it's an ongoing study and it's an ongoing quest. Uh, the study of philosophy really never ends because the the challenges of the history of philosophy and the uh, the resources that are available to us are are virtually endless. There are different specific areas of study within philosophy. If you take a, an introductory course to philosophy, or even the most advanced of courses, you'll see that there are certain specialized areas of the study of philosophy. For instance, uh, there's the, the, the area called metaphysics, which uh, nowadays has uh, uh, you know, gained a, a very different meaning oftentimes. If you walk into a bookstore, there's sometimes a section called metaphysical studies. Uh, those really have very little to do with what I mean metaphysics in this sense. Uh, metaphysics is a, a classical area of philosophy. Aristotle, again, uh, one of the great ancient philosophers, wrote a book called uh, Metaphysics, and the title comes from the opening lines of his book where he, he had written a great work on physics, and he now was writing a book that was beyond the physics, or in addition to the physics, and the Greek word meta has to do with something that's beyond or above uh, physics. So in the, in the area of the intellect, uh, Aristotle had been focusing on the uh, the causes or the reasons for physical motion and the changes in physical things and in his thought that led him to the conclusion that there must be something that transcends physics that grounds the physical world that there are principles uh, that the that the material world functions according to uh, that themselves cannot be ultimately physical and so uh, Aristotle writes his book the metaphysics uh, to talk about those realities that transcend the material world. So metaphysics has come to be a way of referring to that whole area of philosophy that seeks to identify what the ultimate explanations of the material world are, what are those supreme principles of reality that apply to the physical world but also extend beyond the physical world. And again, we'll look at examples of that as we journey through. There's also the area of epistemology. Uh, epistemology is the study of knowledge. The word comes from a Greek word, episteme, which means uh, knowledge. And so epistemology is the study of knowledge itself. What can we know as human beings? What can we be sure of? Uh, what patterns of thought or what uh, structures of, of, uh, of, of reason allow us, or, or sense experience even, allow us to know reality? How can I be sure of my conclusions? In the history of philosophy, there are several different major positions. And then there are all kinds of subcategories within them. Uh, for example, you have those who are skeptics, those who say we can't be sure of the conclusions that we draw through logic. There are also those that are called empiricists. Empiricists or empiricism is a way of referring to those who hold that sense experience is fundamental and primary and the conclusions that we draw must be tied to some kind of direct sense experience or sense verification. Uh, nowadays, much of uh, the scientific community and those who call in question the existence of God, for example, uh, would soundly fall in the category of uh, empiricist epistemolo epistemology. There are people who, who think that the senses alone can be trusted. So if something is not grounded in the senses, then it's not acceptable. And then you have a third uh, epistemological position, which is called rationalism. Uh, rationalism holds that really the senses can't be trusted, it's the activities of the mind. Uh, if you take something like mathematics, mathematics is not 
uh, grounded in, in simply analyzing sense experience, uh, mathematics really abstracts away from sense experience and works with the deductive powers of the mind. And so the rationalist position holds that the mind is trustworthy uh, over the senses. The empiricist position trusts the senses. Uh, there's a very long uh, history of the battle and the sort of vacillation back and forth between these three positions. Uh, you'll have the, the empiricists, they trust the senses. You'll have the, the uh, rationalists who trust the mind and question the senses. And then you have the, uh, the skeptic who will say, well, I can't trust any of them and I can't believe any of these conclusions. And we have all three positions today. Uh, we have all three positions down through the centuries. Uh, and we'll have, uh, as we'll see very soon, in the ancient, among the ancient Greeks, you have this position arising very early on. Uh, and it will continue to be a force all the way through history, like I said a moment ago, even in our world today. Uh, there are other areas of philosophy. Another great one that I should mention here is the area of ethics or morality. Uh, ethics is the effort to try to understand what is good for us as human beings. Many great philosophers begin as ethicists. Uh, they're trying to figure out what is good for human behavior, what is good for human beings, how ought we to act, uh, and what will bring to us the highest levels of happiness. And the ethical reflections are not necessarily tied to uh, a certain uh, theological position or to a, a certain philosophical position. Uh, there, there are people who are you know, materialists and empiricists who are concerned about the ethical life. There are people, on the other hand, who are rationalists who are concerned about the ethical life. And the conclusions that they draw are very interesting ones, and they teach us a lot about what we as human beings uh, think is good and evil and, uh, and how we can arrive at a conclusion about what good and evil are. Uh, so those are some of the areas that we will spend some time reflecting on as we journey through the various different uh, philosophical systems.